Hi folks, welcome to the Zolda Knits podcast. I'm Zolda. This is episode six and it has been so long. I definitely was not intending to leave it this long before recording another episode. I think I did the last one near the end of September and it is now November 30th. I'm hoping to get this edited and up today. It might go up on December 1st. We'll see how the rest of my day goes. But I've just been super busy both with pattern releases, obviously it's knitting season, um, things are really ramping up for my business and I'm sure you've been knitting more too, especially if you're in the northern hemisphere. Um, so I've been really busy actually releasing patterns instead of talking about them and just with life stuff too, this time of year always feels like one thing after another, not bad things, but we were traveling, it was half term for my kid, we had some birthdays in the family, it's Halloween, it's yeah, constant stuff. So I've been really busy um, and I haven't had a chance to record. Every time I've sat down to record something, something's come up. So I'm hoping it all goes smoothly today and I can actually put this episode up because I have so many new projects to show you. Um, I think the last episode focused on the Coracle Cowl, which was from Knitworthy 7, which is my gift knitting collection. It's now in its seventh edition, seventh year. Uh, we did take a couple of years off in the middle, but um, yeah, it's been good to have it back. And it's a collection of six patterns. They're all designed to be good for gifting to yourself or anyone else, especially if you're knitting things for the winter holidays, that sort of gift giving season. They're all small projects, they all make good gifts, they all come in lots of sizes, and the Crococon was the first pattern. Today, the sixth and final pattern comes out, so I thought I'd better actually show you all the, the whole collection. So there have been those five patterns have come out since my last episode, and I released the Any Day sweater, which I have been blown away by your reception of. It is really reassuring, I don't know, motivating, I guess, to um, to see the response to that and to see that the work I'm putting into like all the geeky stuff, the maths and the fit and the sort of engineering of even a really simple pattern is appreciated and that you get it and you get why the pattern has so many pages. I've had really good feedback about how the pattern's written, the instructions, how it how it's laid out. It does have a lot of pages, but there is a contents page, so you can just work from the pages you need. You won't need all of them. There are lots of fit and size options, so I want to talk a little bit more about that in this episode as well. Um, and that pattern is now available if you've been waiting for it and you missed the announcement it came out about a month ago. And you might also notice that I am wearing a new sweater. This is the Muscle Bar Raglan. I am really pleased with this. It's got this like kind of curved raglan line. I'm really happy to have finished this. I wanted it to appeal to people that love knitting the Muscle Bar. If you like knitting lots of stockinette in the round, then this is definitely the project for you. And it has similar details on the raglan to the sort of crown shaping on the Muscle Bar hat. And it also really lends itself. This is um, all in a single color. It's got this like speckled, but it's one yarn. Um, but I wanted to, to work really well for the kind of stripe effects or gradient effects that lots of people have done with the Muscle Bar hat. I am planning another version in um, with stripes on the yoke and maybe the sleeves. Um, so I will share that with you and we are just about to start the preview knit for this one so I'm hoping the pattern will be out uh, late February early March it sounds like forever away but it's really important to me that especially where this is fingering weight it's it could take a fair amount of time to knit it's not very complicated but it's still a lot of knitting and it's really important to me that our preview knits or test knits have a sufficient amount of time that it's not really stressful for the knitters, especially if you're knitting a larger size, because there's no way around it that if you're knitting one of the largest size in the pattern, it's twice as much knitting, if not more, than the smallest size. Um, so I don't think it's fair to base like 
how long the preview knit is on how long it would take me to knit like an extra small sample. It needs to be based on what a reasonable amount of time for someone to knit one of the largest sizes, um, which means there's quite a long like lifetime between now and the pattern being released. But I think it's worth it and I hope you don't mind waiting or if you are participating in the preview knit that I hope that that works out as kind of the right amount of time for you, especially if you're knitting one of the larger sizes. It might seem slightly long if you're knitting one of the smaller sizes, but hopefully that just takes the pressure off. I know sometimes it's really exciting. You want to share your finished project, you want to share it publicly, and it can be difficult if patterns are delayed or if the preview knit is longer to sort of hold on to that excitement and maintain it until the release. But that is why it's quite a generous amount of time. Um, so yeah, that's going on right now. Um, if you have uh, if you have applied for the preview knit, we've got this one and we've got one for another sweater, which I will show you in the next episode. If you have applied for the preview knit, we are going to be sending out emails really soon. Um, do know that we get way more applications than we can actually work with and it is never a judgment on you or your knitting. It's often just about how many applications we get for a particular size, and we wanna make sure we have like a wide range of sizes per unit. And I think between about a 36 and 46 finish bust, we get way more applications than anyone else. It kinda of makes sense that sizing goes on, what do you call that, like a bell curve? And um, so if you're in that size range, it often just comes down to luck. We do look at your projects and we try to have like a wide range of people and but there's often just a lot more people applying for those sizes than we kind of have spots available. So it's not personal. Please do apply for the next one and if you're like how do I get on this preview now? How do I hear about this? We have a dedicated newsletter for preview knit calls um, so if you're not already on that, I will pop a link in the show notes so that you can sign up and you won't miss the next call. This is a fingering weight, a four ply sock yarn. I think it's Merino Nylon from Stranded Dye Works. I want to say it's the Transcendence colorway, um, but I'll double check and put that up on the screen or in the notes. So if you are interested in that, I believe Jude is doing an update. Um, this weekend, I think December 1st or 2nd, I'll double check and I will link to that because I love this yarn and we will be talking more about um, Stranded Dye Works. You should definitely check out that shop update. I really enjoyed working with this and I took the risk of not alternating skeins because mostly I'm lazy and I sort of forgot it was a thing that you do. Um, and it worked out perfectly. I can't actually tell where the transitions between the skins are, so it's beautifully evenly dyed. I don't necessarily recommend that because there can always be variations in hand dyed yarn. It's part of the process. Do you remember that alternating skins is a thing, but I got away with it this time and I'm really happy with the results and how even it is. So yeah, well, that worked out. Okay, knitworthy. Um, I guess let's start with Pattern number two. If you're interested in the first pattern, uh, do check out the previous episode where I really focused on that. Um, so I'm not going to go over that again. I'm going to start with pattern two. So this is the Crown Shy Beanie. And this one is actually in Stranded Dye Works yarn. This is the BFL DK in the Thrive colorway. As DKs go, I would say this is on the heavier kind of worsted end of the spectrum. Um, it's really round and plump and squishy. And I feel like something I've been asked a lot is does it glow as much in real life as in the photos? It absolutely does. It's pretty amazing. It's got this real sheen. Um, and as I was knitting this, this, people kept commenting on how much it glowed. So it's not just in the photos. It does glow like that in real life. And then this version is in Knitting for Olive Heavy Merino, which I really loved working with for these cables. It's very round and plump and bouncy, and it has it shows that sort of 
three dimensions of the cables really well. The green version has this folded stockinette brim. I really love that style and of course it's pretty easy to work. It's a triple layer and it's knit together so it's all nice and smooth and secure and there's actually a hidden layer of 2x2 two two rib which gives you this nice snug fit and transitions really beautifully into this cable pattern. It's like a cable and dip stitch pattern and if you've never tried these kind of double dip stitches it's just a really fun technique and I did put up a YouTube video a tutorial for how to work those when the pattern was released so I'll put a link into that as well. Um, if you're new to those don't worry there's definitely some support to try those and I really like them with this braided cable and then I don't know how well I can show this when it's not on a head. Let's see. So those dip stitches, you kind of um, decrease out the cables. The decreases are really worked into the cables and then the dip stitches all come together. And I really like that it kind of makes this star or it's almost like a sea urchin or what are they, um, sandalers? Yeah. I really like that effect and it did also make me think of the crowns of trees um, and sort of looking up at the canopy. The name is partly from the Becky Chambers book. Um, oh, how is it? Is it a prayer for the crown shy and a psalm for the wild built? I think so. So a prayer for the crown shy, um, which is one of the two monk and robot books. And I really enjoyed those. Um, I think I read the first one kind of at the height of the pandemic. I think it was written in 2020. And it was just this, it's really cozy, but it's also, it's not just escapist. And it's got this sort of, it's set on another planet. Um, we don't really know that much about the world but it's a planet where it's sort of post-industrial and they've realized that industrialization is killing the planet and there was kind of this awakening where the robots that they were using in factories kind of gained consciousness and um, I don't want to give away the whole plot but the robots decided to like that they wanted to study the natural world and they basically went off and broke contact with humans and the humans um, realized that they needed to kind of change how they were living and how they were taking care of their part of the world. Um, so it's kind of a vision of what a planet could be like if we looked after it. It really spoke to me the way that certain things are valued in that world. One of them being the kind of creativity and the labor of making things by hand um, and of using natural resources thoughtfully and like with kind of an awareness of their value and where they come from and what it takes to create them. And also um, the idea of like creating small comforts for other people and for yourself is something that's like not just valued but revered and I was thinking when I started creating this Knitworthy collection not about the sort of visual inspiration um, from that those books and from that world but the idea that when you knit gifts you are literally creating a small comfort to give to someone else and that it sort of inherently has it has the value of like a hat to keep your head warm, but it also has all this other intrinsic value that comes with you, that you made it for someone and you care about that person and you want to show how much you care about them. And it's different from buying a hat and it has a different kind of value. So I was sort of thinking about that when I started on this year's Knitworthy collection. And I also wanted to make all the projects be things that felt like they could fit into that world that someone might make them for someone else and give them as a gift without necessarily being like visually inspired or inspired by the the visual descriptions in that. So yeah, that's a long-winded explanation of why this is called the crown shy beanie. I also just like the idea of crown shyness, which if you don't know, is the concept where 
Um, you've probably seen it visually, but you, if you look at photos of like a forest or a rainforest from the ground looking up at the canopy with the light shining through, you get these kind of this almost crazy quilt effect or like a jigsaw puzzle of the different trees and they leave gaps between them. And we aren't still 100% sure why they do that and what the sort of mechanisms are for the trees to realize that their neighbors are in their space and they should stop growing. Um, but it's something that benefits both the trees themselves and other species. It lets light filter down to the forest floor, which obviously benefits other plants and animals. Um, so yeah, that's crown shyness and kind of liked that idea of we're in community with each other, we're knitting gifts, it's sort of a celebration of that community and we should be thinking when we knit gifts of what we want to knit but also what the other person wants and what their needs are, whether they even want a knitted gift. Knit for people who appreciate it and who are knit worthy. And the colorways. So this is Thrive and this is knitting for all of Heavy Merino in the Marzipan colorway. I'm going to come back to this one because I actually used this yarn for one of the other projects and this was kind of an impulsive custom with my leftovers. And you could do that quite a lot with these projects. I kind of like that um, you could use your leftovers from one project in another one. I've got another example of that coming up. Pattern number three. I have several samples so it might be a little tricky to hold them all up. Are we gonna focus? We are gonna focus. Okay, so these are the cabin slippers. They are super, super cozy brioche. Um, this is sort of easier to show on feet, which is a bit awkward to film. Might put a photo up. But they're worked from the cuff down. You can choose to make these shorter or longer, so you can have enough length to fold over or not. And then they have these kind of increases that form this, like, I really like this curved shape that sort of opens up over the foot. And then when you get to here, you kind of ignore these stitches that go around the back and you work back and forth across the top of the foot. Um, it feels a bit like knitting the tongue of a shoe, but in reverse. And then you pick up stitches all the way around and then knit across those stitches you kind of ignored. Um, you do a few rounds in the round and then the sole here these have been laid flat for too long. Uh, let's see, can you see? So the sole here is worked back and forth in garter stitch, which is one of my favorite stitches for slipper soles because it's just so squishy and thick. Um, ignore that. So this is worked back and forth and you you have these stitches on the sides live, so as you go back and forth, you're decreasing onto them. And it means that when you get to here, you've just got a few stitches to join at the back of the heel um, with some grafting. So they're almost, almost seamless. They're a fun project if you've never done brioche before. If you are looking to learn brioche, maybe that's your goal for the new year. I do have a beginner brioche course that's available on my website, so I'll link that down below. You'll learn to knit um, four accessory projects and all the skills that you would need to knit the cabin slippers. So that might be a good place to start if you are new to brioche and looking to learn. In terms of yarns, um, these two pairs are in Briggs and Little Heritage, which is a great rustic yarn. This is a Canadian yarn from a Canadian mill. And you can see close up, it's got this um, beautiful dyed in the wool heather effect. It's a little bit like a chunky, um, maybe like a Shetland yarn, but it's not chunky, it's like worsted iron weight. Um, but it's got this lovely heathered effect. And it's not, it's not super soft, but it is kind of squishy. Um, knitting with this was super moisturizing on my hands. It's definitely still got a lot of lanolin in it, so especially at this time of year, that is no bad thing.
And then these ones in this gorgeous dark teal. This is Sunness Garn Pure Gint. These are a little bit um, floppier, I guess, drapier, um, a little bit more bed sock style, or you could absolutely add a sole to them. And something I would say about Pure Gint, it's all uh, Norwegian wool, and it is a good kind of workhorse yarn for things like this. I have found that the neutrals are a little bit crunchier and more rustic than the dyed colors. I don't know if that's just the ones I've used. Um, let me know in the comments if you've worked with it and you've had that experience. But definitely I knit a sweater that I haven't shown you yet in um, like a light gray and it's like a really different yarn than this one. It's much woolier and more rustic. Um, yeah, that's just my observation. I don't know if that's just the batches I had, but it does seem to correlate with the dyed versus neutral colors. Uh, so these are the cabin slippers. They are super, super cozy. And those do come in a big size range, so you can make them for little kids or like adult extra large. Next up, we have the third pattern. This is possibly the simplest pattern in the collection. And it's also one of my absolute favorites. It's these two by two, well mostly two by two ribbed mitts with this curved gusset for the thumb where you increase, so these are worked from the cuff up and you increase into one column and those increased stitches actually become part of the palm rather than part of the thumb. And I've used this um, gusset style quite a lot in some other patterns. You might have tried my Belize colorwork mitts, but I really love that gusset style. It's super comfortable, it's easy to work, and I like that it kind of follows the, oh, is it the lifeline on your hand? The heart line? I never remember which one is which, but yeah, it follows one of those. Um, so it's sort of, it just is kind of pleasing, it makes sense. And I really like um, that these have long finger cuffs. That sounds weird. I don't know what to call this, but these, you can unfold them, um, basically. So I have kind of long fingers, but you can unfold them. You can kind of tortoise your fingers in if it's cold while still maintaining like really easy access if you need to use your phone or your keys or whatever. Um, I kind of like flip top mitts. I like the concept more than the in practice usually with flip top mitts. It's like a lot of fiddling with buttons or there's something flopping in the way. So these are kind of a nice compromise. Um, if it's not quite so cold that you need full mittens, but you want to keep your fingers warm and tucked in um, and still use your hand a lot, these are really nice. Great for photographers, anyone that uses their hands outdoors or with the cost of heating these days, anyone who works from home maybe and doesn't want to heat the whole house when it's just them or you're typing in a cold office, these are definitely good for typing as well. Um, yeah, so these are the Rodin mitts. These are knit in um, John Arbin Yarnadelic Worsted in the Galetta Guitar colorway. I'll tell you more about that yarn later because I used my leftovers for another project um, and with some other colors. So I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But before I move on to the next pattern, I did want to show you my absolute favorite detail on these. So the cuffs at the wrist are in one by one rib. This is too much knitwear. Is that a thing? Anyway, the cuffs here are one by one rib and then they transition to two by two rib which obviously usually you would get like a jog where you have columns of ones and then columns of twos, they don't stack up very nicely. Um, so I'm really, really happy with the transition. There we go, let's focus again. I'm thrilled with this transition between one by one rib and two by two rib. It's easy to work, it's super simple, it looks really beautiful, very, I don't know, dorky to be so excited about a ribbing transition, but I am. I'm trying to think where else I could use it. Uh, yeah, I just found that really pleasing. I made quite a lot of swatches to get that to work. So I really love that detail. And I think it gives these a really polished 
look. It's very minimalist. It would work for a lot of different people's styles. It's very unisex. Um, yeah, so those are the Rotom Mints. And those do come in... Um, did I write it down? No, I did not. They come in a lot of sizes for, yeah, different people on your gift list. The Rotom Mints were the simplest pattern. Pattern number five might just be the coziest. This is the Build Balaclava. It is super, super snuggly. We took the photos for this in Canada last sort of early spring, last, this year, but ages ago, early spring. And it just happened to like start with the most perfect sprinkling of snow while we were walking in the woods, hoping we would get some nice lights for photos. So that was really magical. And I had to test out that it is perfect when it is snowing. It's also really good for if it's windy. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorite things is, um, I don't know if you can tell really, but it's got this kind of long neck. It's just, I might have to put this on because it doesn't really look like anything holding it up. Yeah, so it's got this long neck that just kind of drapes really well without adding like too much to tuck into your coat. I kind of feel like if you're wearing a bag of clava, it's probably cold enough that you're wearing a coat. Um, it looks a bit weird with uh, just a thin sweater, but yeah, it's got this neck that you will can tuck into your coat and you won't get snow or sleet or rain down the back of your neck, um, which is the worst. Or that gap between your hat and your cowl or your scarf. Just make a balaclava, avoid all of that. Um, and it's got like a kind of bigger face opening. I spent a lot of time looking at balaclavas before designing this. And I just found that like I liked that drape and I live in Scotland. It gets kind of wild in the winter here, but it's never, it's never quite so cold that I felt like I needed like one of the balaclavas with just an eye opening. But what you can do is you can, um, kind of control this rating is knit at the end, you can con control your tension or you could run some elastic through the edge if you do want it to kind of snug in more around your face um, and really protect you from the elements there. I'm going to take this off before I get heat stroke wearing it indoors. <laughs> um, so this is knit kind of like a giant sock heel. Oh, well you can see that but the cast on edge is like across here and then you knit a rectangle and then pick up stitches along the sort of long sides of that rectangle and start working not in the round because you need an opening but around from one side to the other all the way around and there's a bit of shaping here that I really enjoyed how that shaping fit into the stitch pattern and um, that worked out really well so it is almost like turning a sock heel if that's something you've done before. If it's not, it could be a good introduction before you knit your first pair of socks. How close can I get and still have this in focus? That seems okay. So this also has this waffly, like I called it the mini waffle um, slip stitch pattern. Um, I'm sure I didn't invent this, more unvented it, but I did a lot of swatching and found like certain combinations of knits and pearls and slip stitches um, created a more three-dimensional texture than others. So I'm really pleased with how it has these really deep three-dimensional pockets. Um, it's super warm without being heavy. It traps a lot of air and it's really easy to knit too. If you can knit and pearl and slip stitches, you can absolutely knit this. There is nothing more complicated than that going on. And it's just like a two stitch repeat. It's I think four rows and two stitches. Um, and one of those rows is like pearl. So it's, um, yeah, super simple. It's a fun pattern to add to your repertoire and it creates this really lofty, waffly, squishy fabric. This one is, so the pattern is like chunky weight. This is knit in the Knitting for All of Heavy Merino that I also used for this hat in the marzipan colorway but in this case um, you can kind of see it's got this fuzzy halo. I held it together with their, I think it's called soft silk mohair, their kid silk 
like kid silk mohair blend, um, lace weight. So any kind of worsted held together with like a lace weight fluff would work. Cerebe alpaca would be gorgeous as well. I can't work out what I did with the other sample for this. It's kicking about somewhere, but it wasn't where it was supposed to be. Um, but I do have the yarn. So we also used um, Woolfolk Luft, which is, um, I think they're called a blown construction. So it's got like a, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's got a cotton, like a knitted tube, almost like an eye cord, I guess, of like really fine cotton yarn knit into a tube. And then it's, wool fiber is, I guess it's called blown because it's blown through that tube. I feel like I need to see a video of how they actually make yarns like this. I've just heard that description. I don't know what the machinery looks like. Anyway, what it is, is really, really soft and bouncy and fluffy. And it is perfect for a balaclava. So that is Woolfolk Luft. Um, this is L7, romantic color name. <laughs> um, yeah, Woolfolk Luft. So that also worked really well for the Beeled Balaclava. Uh, you can see that sample in the photos and it's here somewhere. We're doing good. We are at pattern number six, which is today's new pattern. I hope it's today when you watch this. It might be yesterday, tomorrow. I don't know. Anyway, it is um, the final knitworthy pattern and I actually have a few here. It is this really fun colorwork hat. This is the Broch Beanie. If uh, that CH sound is confusing, it's B-R-O-C-H, uh, like Loch. Uh, it's Broch. Uh, it might be the only time I sound vaguely Scottish, although I actually am. Um, a broch is like a medieval, earlier, I need to look that up, um, structure that if you've ever been to the Scottish Highlands, you might have actually seen. They're kind of a round stro stone structure. You see more um, like ruins, like just the foundations left. Um, but yeah, they were sort of forts, houses, um, these big round structures. And there's a little bit of a theme in some of the patterns of words for shelters or refuges. Um, and I felt like Broch fit really well with both the shape of this beanie, but also the way the stitch pattern is kind of like stones fitting together or bricks. And um, that it's really versatile. You can build it in your kind of your own way. So this is a little kid one. This one looks a little bit different because this was my first prototype and I knit it from the top down and then decided there was sort of no advantage to doing that and it was easier to knit the color work from the bottom up, especially at the crown. You can see I didn't actually do the crown. Okay, maybe you can see. I didn't actually do the crown here in color work whereas in the final version which is knit bottom up, it's pretty easy to keep the color work going into the crown and I really like how that looks and the effect you get. I decided, so yeah, I decided bottom up worked better for this design. Um, so that first sample might look slightly different, but it is showing it kind of, you could do a kid size and that these use the same colors, but kind of arrange differently for a similar but different effect. And the pattern, as I said, is very versatile. It actually includes gauges for three yarn weights. So you can do, uh, like a four ply, like a sock yarn, um, sport, and then DK or worsted. So this version is in sock yarn. I made this from sock yarn scraps. I love this so much. It was a really challenging project for me. Not because the knitting is hard, it's not, but because I decided to really embrace random colors. Um, and that's hard, yeah. So the pattern includes, as I said, three yarn weights and six sizes from baby to adult extra large. And it also includes notes on how to kind of deal with colors. So you can knit this in two colors, um, sort of one background color and then uh, it's really clear on the worsted version. It's not, it's like a one by one color work pattern. It's super simple, but it does make tiny, tiny zigzags. Um, so there is kind of a, more of a pattern color and a background color. 
Um, you could do just two colors. Uh, Bex made one that I'll try and get a photo of for you that has, um, I can't remember which yarn she used for the sort of solid, but she combined a solid color with um, spin cycles, like long self-striping, and that was really effective. Um, if you have one of those yarns or a hand spun would be great, especially you don't need very much of that contrast color. Um, so if you've got like a little bit of hand spun or you're a new spinner and you've made some but you're not sure what to do with it, that would be a really fun project to kind of highlight that and highlight some color shifts. Um, or you can do lots of colors. I think this one has eight or nine. They are written out in the pattern if you really like this color combination and want the exact colors. And this one is in uh, John Arbin Yarnadelic, which I really love. This is the worsted weight version. There is also a sport weight which you could use for this pattern as well. Um, so you can do like a nice matching but not too matching set, especially if you're doing a gift. Um, if you have one full skein, you could definitely make the rotten mitts and then you use it. I used that color here just for the brim, but I would have had enough to incorporate it further on, maybe if I wasn't using so many colors. So that could be a nice option. Um, and it comes in this really cohesive color palette. This is the shade card. It's a little bit crumpled. Um, but yeah, I feel like all of these colors work beautifully together and they come in minis. So if you want to make like a color work project like this and you know you're only going to use a little bit of each color, you'll still have leftovers you could use for, you could make another hat, arrange them differently, but you don't have to buy like 900 grams of yarn to make a color work hat. Um, it's not going to cost a fortune. It's really nice that these come in mini skeins and you could get a full size skein and a mini skein if you wanted to make some mitts something like that or you could just do a bunch of minis and make a hat so that's really nice and this is 100% cordel it's really beautiful it's soft and lustrous we are all about the yarns that glow today um so yeah these are really pretty and it comes it's these kind of rich colors um just like the briggs and little heritage this is dyed in the wool which means it's spun from dyed fiber rather than they spin white yarn and then dye it and that's how you get these gorgeous come on it doesn't want to focus today i'm trying out some new autofocus settings and i don't think it's working very well um but hopefully hopefully this can work with this and it's watchable and um, so yeah you get these like subtle but kind of heathered colors and I think that's part of why the whole palette works really well together because they'll be spinning these um kind of using the same colors of fiber to make different colorways and that's makes it beautifully cohesive I really enjoyed working with that. I'm hoping to make a garment with it soon. And then this one, as I said, is a sock yarn scrap. I don't really know what any of them are. Um, these were actually a gift. Um, I basically used this giant basket. Um, so if this looks really familiar to you, you have something like this uh, sitting around that you don't know what to do with then um, this hat is not gonna use it a lot, but it is definitely a good option for playing with colors there. Um, and these were actually mostly gifted to me by my friend Jude from Stranded Dye Works. So thank you, Jude, for this super generous donation. I don't knit a ton of socks, so I don't actually have a lot of fingering weight hand dyed sock, sock yarn. That was a lot of ways to say the same thing, but I don't have a lot of scraps, so it was really generous to and really exciting to get those to play with and to play with colors. And this is a fun way to play around with colors in kind of a low stakes sort of way if you find color a bit intimidating. Um, and the color work pattern itself is so simple that you can focus on choosing what color to do next. And as I said, the pattern includes um, some notes and some link tutorial tutorials for um, how to kind of choose your colors or how to put them together if you're working with just like a pile of yarn. 
um, and also what to do with the yarn ends. Um, in terms of like how to deal with color choices, what I did for actually what I did for the uh, yarn adelic version is there aren't that many different color stripes, so I just picked out a color each time I got to picking a new color. I just picked one that I liked with the color I just used and so on and made sure that it as long as it had enough contrast with the color I just used then that was fine. So I've used the same colors for some sometimes those colors are in narrower stripes which are the pattern stripes and sometimes they're in the wider stripes which are the background stripes and um, they kind of shifted about like that. I just picked whichever color I wanted to use next. Whereas for the fingering weight version, I felt like it was going to take forever to knit if I stopped to pull out a new colour and I started off trying to do that and I had like this big bag of yarn and it was just going to get tangled. So what I actually did and which made this really fun and really challenging is I split all my colours. Um, I did cool and warm just because the colours I was working with that sort of made sense. I had ones that were I had a lot of blues and greens and then more reds and oranges and then somewhere in between and I just kind of picked what was most dominant. Um, so I did like a red, a warm batch and a cool batch. Another simple way to split them would be lights and darks. And then I made magic yarn balls. Um, I worked out how long the yarn should be for each one by I just knit a few rounds and then ripped them out and used that to like measure my lengths of yarn so that I could tie those all together and make like a warm, I did warm for the pattern color and cool for the background color. Um, if you're not sure what I mean by background and pattern colors, it's in the pattern you'll sort of see on the chart. There's also written directions for this color work because it's so simple and it allowed us to make a low vision accessible version. Um, but part of that is about color dominance. Um, I do have a class on stranded color work if you want to learn more about that. Um, but basically you want to make sure that you're holding your yarn when you do strand and color work so that um, one color is always kind of coming under the other um, and so that is ends up looking slightly more dominant. I use that for the pattern color. Um, in this case it's kind of a useful way to just break down like which batch is which to. Um, so I made one magic yarn ball for the pattern colour in warm shades and then one for the background colour in cooler shades. Um, and then I just knit and if I wasn't sure about how two colours looked next to each other, did they have enough contrast, you can sort of see about here there is kind of a purplish area. Um, where I think one is like a cooler grey and that made it into my cooler colours and one is more perp warmer, like pale purple and that made it into the warm colours. There's not a lot of contrast here but I decided to just go with it even if I thought like maybe the orange and green is kind of ugly together or why is there so much orange in this section? And I'm really happy with the result because I think the way you get bits that are lower contrast and bits that are higher contrast works really well and it makes this sort of painterly effect and f the, from a distance then the whole thing it's sort of cohesive without being flat um so i'm really happy with that it was it was hard to let go and um yeah deal with that and if you're gonna if you want to try that magic yarn ball thing it's fun i it's not super precise, you can kind of see here that the exact place I changed colours ended up jumping around a bit because you could probably be more accurate, I didn't actually measure my yarn that perfectly um, but they're all, there's different yarns in here, they're probably slightly different weights your tension varies a bit depending on what you're doing I just decided to run with it, I did get a little fussier once I got to the crown and I actually retied like the knots so that I was switching colours every round rather than using... I wanted to keep the stripe effect rather than once you start decreasing you might end up using like one colour for two stripes or three stripes. Um, so I did get fussier at that point but it was just a few rounds at the top so it, was, it wasn't too much to deal with stopping and starting to tie those knots. Um, so yeah there's more information in the pattern about 
how to do that magic yarn ball thing if you're intrigued. Um, hi, please focus on me. Okay, and this version, I don't know how well you can see the join. You can see there's a little bit of a jog there. There are some techniques you can use to avoid a jog. It didn't really bother me on the back of a hat, but I want to show you the inside. Because the inside is exciting because there are no joins, well there are joins, but there are no ends to weave in at all. Uh, well, I think there was an end like at the cast on and one at the top of the crown. Otherwise, throughout the colour work, I had no ends to weave in, which is pretty magical. And there's no knots. Um, so I used a technique that one of our network members shared a few years ago when we did the colour work club, I think. I need to actually find the post so I can credit them properly. Um, but it's one of those like really genius things that then is like, this is so simple, how did I never think of this? Um, but if you've ever tried spit splicing yarn, which is where you get like with a non super bush wool, usually the, something that felt swell, you can spit on it or use some water and rub the ends together and felt them together. It generally helps to kind of unravel them a bit, fluff it up, and you'll lay one end on top of the other, rub them together. If you've tried that, you'll know that if you do that with two colours, you get kind of a barber pole effect, which is fine, you could do that, especially if you're doing something where it would be hidden, that join. But if you're doing two contrasting colours, it's not a very neat transition. However, this knitter suggested taking the two pieces of yarn and instead of laying them together like this, basically crisscrossing them and then folding each back on itself, something like this. And then when you felt it, you get this perfect, perfect join. So I made the like quickest, dirtiest little tutorial um, for this pattern. Uh, you might have just got it from that explanation, but if you do want to see a visual, um, there is a little tutorial, I'll link that, um, and you can try that out. It should work with anything, yeah, non superwash, wool, um, should work with things like alpaca, those kind of, obviously not silk, but those animal fibers that would felt. Uh, unfortunately, most of my sock yarn, I didn't have any labels, so most of my sock yarn scraps, I kind of assumed from how they felt they were superwash, so I didn't go for that option on the sock yarn, but if you were using non superwash, you could absolutely do that. And that is a really nice technique because, yeah, it's you're basically turning all your different colors into one continuous piece of yarn and then there's no ends to do it with. And it's pretty quick, it's pretty easy to do as you go. The other option uh, that I included in the pattern notes is a Russian join, which um, you can do in a similar way where you um, kind of link the two colors together, but instead of felting them, you use a darning needle and thread, like kind of the tail back through the yarn. Um, beautiful join, can make it a little bit thicker, but it does work well with yarns that don't felt. A um, little bit time consuming, so that's why I went with the Magic Knot option for my fingering whip version. I tried out the Russian join method, it worked beautifully, but I didn't want to stop and start my project constantly. Um, that might not bother you, but I wanted something that was, it's a hat, I wanted, it's kind of simple colour work with a good rhythm. I wanted it to be an easy project to carry around and do as I went while I was on the go, and I didn't like how stopping to do those Russian joins really broke my rhythm and I had to keep track of my darning needle stuff. So that might be an option that works well for you though. So it is in the notes. So that is the Broch Beanie. I'm really excited to see all your colour play with this. There's just so many possibilities. Um, and yeah, it, you can make something completely unique, really beautiful, and really play with colour. And, and yeah, like control it or let go and give yourself that challenge. It is definitely challenging to embrace the kind of random Lastly, before I go today, I do want to talk a tiny bit about the Any Day sweatshirt. So, I'm going to undress my mannequin. Hopefully without knocking everything over. So, this is the Any Day sweatshirt. The pattern is now available. 
if you haven't seen it. And it is actually size inclusive. It includes sizes from about an extra small to a 7XL, and that is like a 7XL that's actually a 7XL and not a 40 inch bust. Um, so that's comparable to sort of clothing retailers. Um, and it also includes options for tall and regular heights. This is the regular version. Um, and there are body fit options for four cup size options. You can do uh, like no bust slash A to B cups. And then um, there are cup size options up to an H cup um, with bust darts. Uh, if you do want to know more about how that works, um, if you go back and watch episode one and episode two where I talk about this pattern and the Gullen tank top, uh, I go into more depth about how the bust shaping in this works. And you can combine um, the bust shaping options with the tall or regular versions. So those aren't like gendered versions. Um, you can do what works best for your body or the person you're knitting for. Uh, the sleeve length is not interchangeable. There are like sleeve lengths for the tall and regular versions. Um, the only reason they're not interchangeable is because the stitch count on the sleeves is picked up around this drop shoulder armhole. Um, so if you knit the tall upper body, um, then you want to pick up the right number of stitches for the tall sleeve and then the shaping is worked for that. Um, you could quite easily adjust those, um, but I'm trying to find a balance between like the pattern being really bloated and having lots of sizing options. Um, but if you do need shorter sleeves with the taller body, you could um, quite easily adjust those by knitting fewer rounds before the cuff once your shaping is complete. So there is some flexibility there. Um, I love this little V sweatshirt detail and that's worked with like simple cable stitches and garter stitch and the pattern does have charts and written directions for that. And then I also really like this shoulder detail and I've had great feedback from that. I've had really nice feedback on that from knitters. It's the very beginning of the sweater, it's sort of a nice little piece of scaffolding to build it off of that gives those shoulders some structure and prevents everything just like stretching out, which is kind of always the possibility, the risk, I guess, of a seamless sweater. So that's why that's there. Really happy with that. Um, pattern is available on my website and Ravelry. All of the Knitworthy patterns are available in the Knitworthy 7 collection, which is also available on my website and Ravelry. And they're currently exclusive to the collection, but we will be releasing individual patterns mid-December. I want to say the 17th, but I might have that wrong. So yeah, mid-December, um, those will be available individually. If maybe you just want to knit one of them, uh, you don't have to buy the whole collection. Um, you can just wait until that single pattern is released. Uh, obviously there is a saving on buying the whole collection over the individual patterns. The tipping point I think is if you want to make more than three of them, then the whole collection is the better deal. Uh, but there are options available, so take advantage of that. Choose which works best for you. I am really hoping to be back here sooner than two plus months. Um, I have like a whole list of things I want to talk to you about to set out all the knitworthy patterns. I had to clear off my table of um, the yarn I wanted to show you and I've got like a whole pile of stitch dictionaries. I wanted to do an episode talking about um, a couple of new ones that I got recently and my favorites. Uh, it's a question I get a lot as a designer. Um, where do I get inspiration? What stitch dictionaries do I like? Kind of where do I get ideas? What do I work from? So I really want to do an episode sharing those. Um, and I still have a lot of sweater fitting kind of design stuff I want to talk about. So I've got a whole list. I just need to find a little bit more time to record these. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to be back here much sooner. 
and until I see you next time, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode, whenever it is. Um, you can also sign up to my newsletter or our preview knitting list. Both of those links are down below and I'll put in links to my website and Ravelry store as well in case you're interested in any of these patterns. And yeah, until I see you next time, happy knitting and stay nice and warm. Take care guys, bye.